Reading Swift Rivers by Cornelia Meese, Chapter 6b, pages 193 to 210. For nearly half a mile, he tramped along the sun-beaten bar and stopped in the tiny patch of shade under the great dead tree at the outer end. He heard the sound of rowlocks and a voice behind him. Stuart, with one of the boats, had come rowing across the stretch of water and had set the skiff's bow against the sand. Get in, he said briefly. Chris slipped into the forward seat and took the oar, which the other relinquished to him. He felt that he could not sit in the stern. He wished at the moment to look into nobody's face. But as they rowed away together, he felt a little comfort stealing over the soreness of his misery. No matter what happens, it is of help always to have a true friend. They dropped down the river half a mile, nearly, nearly a mile. Only a few times had they gone so far in pursuit of their logs, for there were bends and beaches everywhere upon the, which the fugitives were almost certain to catch. All those which they had found at all were ashore within a quarter of a mile of the disaster. The rest had vanished without even a scattering of stragglers to mark their progress downstream. But since neither of the boys had any wish to return to their bickering comrades on the sandbar, they went rowing steadily forward. They had gone a long way before Stuart announced suddenly, I have made a guess as to where the walnut tree and the others have gone. Chris did not answer, although he was beginning to have some vague surmise of his own. He was, for the moment, too weary, too heavy of heart to fix his mind upon anything. But the thought grew insistent so that, after a little, as though to test his own guess by that of his companion, he said indifferently, We are getting rather close to the Indian's creek. Pierre warned us to keep out of the way of the village. He recollected very vividly that one of Dumanal's special instructions had been, do not have any trouble with the Indians. It would be serious for you. Moreover, it would be bad for every man that comes after you down the river. Some groups of Indians are friendly. Some are indifferent, but some obstinately hostile. This village of red men has a bad reputation, even among their own kind. It is well to keep away from them yourselves, and by all means to prevent the raftsmen from going near. If they do, there will be an outbreak at once. All this Stuart must surely remember. And must he not remember also that the incident in the Northwoods, where even a friendly Chippewa chief had burst forth in wrath and threatened his life? Nevertheless, he kept rowing on, and Chris, with a dawning grin of comprehension, pulled steadily with him. They brought the boat to shore some hundreds of yards above the inflowing of the tributary creek, which came in on the west side of the Mississippi. It was broad and sluggish, bordered with willows like every such watercourse, but appearing to be deeper than a good many of the rivulets which dropped into the vastness of the main stream. The two, evidently in one mind without need of speech, pulled the skiff out of sight into a clump of willow brush, brush and slid into the soft green thicket which fringed the bank. They made their way cautiously among the close tangled stems, advancing with a care and silence which would have done credit to the red men themselves. A long, hot journey it was, nearly two miles over rough ground, always wrapped in the soft, concealing cloud of willow foliage. Stuart was ahead and suddenly stopped, motioning for, to Chris for complete quiet. They could look through an opening in the undergrowth and see, almost opposite them, the Indian village. Very still and empty it was at that time of day, with the braves away hunting or fishing, and only the women to tend the tumbling children in the fires. The creek, which lay between the boys and the group of pointed lodges, was very broad here, 300 feet across at the least, and the whole surface of it was covered with logs. In the middle, possibly a ground even in that depth, looming enormous amongst the other trunks, was the little nut tree. Not every warrior, however, had gone to hunt that day. As the boys lay in the underbrush watching, one Indian came striding down the worn trail to the foot of the bank just across from them. He was making sure, evidently, that the precious logs were all safe. He launched a wooden canoe and paddled carefully back and forth among the captive flotilla, pushing one log here and turning another back there to be certain that none should drift away in the slow current of the creek. He passed very close to where the boys were concealed so that they should see his face plainly, a harsh, cruel countenance, very different from that of the Indians with whom Chris was familiar. 
He was used to the quiet and outwardly friendly Chippewa who had lived at peace with two generations of white settlers. He had not thought that it would be a matter of great difficulty to recover the stolen property from the pilfering red men. It would not have been so much with the northern people, but here was not here was an affair of much greater import. As he realized with the sudden miss of a heartbeat, they had to do now with sullen savages who needed but little excuse to break out into flaming hostility. The canoe went on, threading its way through the mass of trunks which bumped and chafed together as they all lay lazily afloat in the willow-fenced pool. Chris saw the man pass close to the great walnut tree and lay his hand upon it to feel the rough texture of its bark. Some of the logs the Indians could make into canoes, though they never would find use for all of them. There was nothing that they could do with Grandfather's beloved tree, since they, most, since they must soon discover that, with the spruce stems pinned to it, the great mass would not float, and that their rude tools could do little with its tough wood. They would burn it, perhaps, in some ceremonial fire, and exult it as they did so, in the feat of outwitting the white men. Was it for this that Grandfather had so courageously cut it down? Grandfather, who had said that Chris Dahlberg's road to fortune was to set out from the foot of the little nut tree? Stuart whispered softly into his friend's ear, We can't do anything until the dark comes. Chris nodded agreement. When the Indian had landed and disappeared over the ridge of the opposite bank, the boys slipped noiselessly away and came back to their boat. They embarked in silence and pulled upstream. I don't care back to go back to that idle, snarling lot on the raft, Stuart said finally. I brought some food, and we'll just land somewhere and wait until night. Shall we climb the bluff across from the bar? I've wanted to have time to go up there ever since we began our work at Lone Tree Crossing. They pulled past the tip of the bar, crossed the stretch of rapid current, and came into the shade of the hill. It was graciously cool after the hot blaze of the sun on the water. They brought the boat to a landing and noticed a faint trail leading up through the bushes toward the top of the bluff, made by deer, perhaps, who grazed above and came down at nightfall to drink. The two had, so far, had no time to explore anything but the low reaches of shore where the logs lay. Without more ado, they jumped out of the boat, made it fast, and set out to climb the almost indiscernible path. They were scarcely prepared for what they saw when they reached the summit. It was so high that they could look to the eastward over the windings of the Mississippi, over the lowlands opposite and across to the glint of crooked streams, where tributaries wandered through the green and emptied into the river. But it was not that view of islands and waters at which both boys stood gazing, for their eyes were turned to the west. Chris had heard men speak of the prairie, lying beyond the hills which bordered the river. It was just here that the prairie reached forward and came to the very edge of the Mississippi Bluffs. Even at home in his own wooded valley, he had heard talk of the vast plains country, which was so utterly different from the northern region of hill and forest. Here he could look upon it at last, a tremendous stretch of rolling green, which spread away without tree or hillock to the straight edge of the horizon. White towering clouds went blowing past for overhead, their shadows on the ground seeming to follow the rippling of the grass. He sat down upon the turf, close cropped where deer had grazed. Thus he remained for a long time, his chin on his hand, his elbow on his knee, his eyes looking afar over the immeasurably wide landscape. This also was one of the possessions of that green empire of Louisiana, of which the lonely man upon the island had spoken as the king of Spain's daughter. A princess she truly was with all that wealth of fertile acres. There were great bare mountains at the far edge of them, so he had been told, where was said to lie a fabulous treasure of gold and silver. With her mines and her forests and her endlessly moving waters, this Louisiana was a regal province indeed. It was strange to him, sitting there at the edge of that enormous wilderness, to think that he and Stuart and Mr. Barton Howland might, after all, prove to be the means of including the, va the last valuable miles within the boundaries of that broad realm. If that man on the island were right, it might be as a result of their effort that Louisiana should reach out so far as Grandfather's Hill above the river, 
where through those long years had grown and flourished grandfather's great walnut tree. He was so lost in dreams that he had not paid much attention to Stuart, who had cast himself down upon the grass beside him. But when Chris Dahlberg's far thoughts came finally wandering back again, he looked down at his friend and began to notice how worn and tired was Stuart's face and how heavy was the cloud which brooded over it. Chris felt that he could not fathom the depths of Stuart's restlessness and of his overwhelming desire for something new. His own discouragement was so near to despair that he felt he had nothing left to offer. He turned about to look at the river, the long bar, and the great single tree which dominated it. The raft looked little at that distance, a frail toy smashed by man's arrogant carelessness against this giant hostility of nature. Chris was a boy whose very character, even as Pierre Dumanel had seen, demanded that when he began a task, he must pursue it to an end. But here, the end seemed utterly impossible. Not merely the recovery of all the logs, but the restoring of discipline and courage, of bringing back the whole wrecked venture into something which might be called success. He had almost forgotten that phase of the undertaking, which was to turn the timber into money for him and for Alexis Stahlberg. It was the keeping of his word to himself, to grandfather, to Pierre Dumanal, that was the only purpose of which he had any thought now. If he failed, would he ever have real confidence again? Would not any enterprise into which he flung his energy always have behind it that whisper of a doubt and the remembrance of disaster at Lone Tree Crossing? As for Stuart and what he could be thinking, that, that Chris could make no attempt to guess. His comrades still lay full length upon the grass looking moodily down at the river. What would be the effect on his unstable nature if they should give up this thing? Stuart had promised both himself and Pierre Dumanal that he would, for the first time, carry long labor to completion. His own problem was so heavy that Chris could make no effort to judge that of his friend. Yet the suspense of uncertainty was so great, the younger boy felt he could not endure it. It was surely better to face the question courageously and settle it. Stuart, he said, trying to keep any real expression from his tone. Stuart, do you think that what the rivermen told us was right? and that we can never make this wreck float again? Do you think we ought to give, a, give it up? His friend did not answer for such a long time that Chris turned finally to follow his eyes, to see if there were anything in that widespread scene below them which would so greatly absorb him. Stewart's glance was fixed upon an upper bend where there was slowly coming into view another raft. It advanced deliberately and floated toward them at the crawling pace belonging to that manner of craft. Both the boys watched in intense silence as it approached. Stuart spoke finally, but in the most casual of tones. It's probably the last one that will go by this summer. The season for starting them downstream is well over by now. They continued to watch as it came near. There was time, ample time, for them to go down the path, push off their boat, and row out to ask for passage to St. Louis. After all, was not that broken thing on the sandbar a failure beyond hope of remedy? Had they not given it, given to it all that was in them to no avail? The minutes went by, one by one. Stuart, Chris said again, are you going? A quiver went over Stuart's white face. It looked much as it had on that night in the log hut beside the river when he had escaped with such difficulty from the evil company into which his wandering adventures had brought him. Perhaps he was thinking of that moment now. At last he spoke one word which dropped on the still air as sharp and sudden as a pistol shot. No. There's a little pause after that one brief and decisive statement. Then Stewart spoke again more casually. No, I'm not going. Are you? He looked up at his companion, a slow smile spreading over his drawn face, while Chris, in his turn, relaxed into relieved and joyful reply. No, I'm not going either. They both got up and went closer to the edge of the bluff. The raft was so near that they could make out in the stern a man with a bandaged head, who might be Spike Ellerby. They were both most anxious to see whether or not the raft was to stop, and if so, what would be the effect upon their dejected and idle crew. But the pilot was evidently in haste to be down the river and made no motion to check his course. They could see him put his hands to his mouth to shout across to Ned Kelly, probably with the offer of help which every riverman is bound to give to another. 
Ned, Cal Ned Kelly's reply was brief, although the men about him were all lining up along the edge of the sandbar. Perhaps the other was too wise to offer opportunity to deserters and felt that the best way that he could stand by a brother pilot was to sail past at a distance. The dark shape of the moving raft began presently to drift into the curve of the river and at last slowly disappeared. Seward, with a changed and cheerful face, strolled away along the shoulder of the bluff. In the woods below, on their own side of the river, was the far-off sparkle of water here and there, the Indian's Creek. With his eyes upon it, he observed easily. It's not going to be so long until dark now. They waited with what patience they could until evening had passed into a night of stars without any moon. They descended the hill, got into their boat, and rowed down the river, keeping to the deep black shadow cast by the bluff, in which practically all things were invisible. They pulled this time to the very mouth of the creek with such gently dipping oars that the soft splash could not possibly have been heard above the murmur of water slipping over the limestone edges ledges. Once more, they beached the boat well under cover beneath an overhanging bank and made the rest of their way forward on foot. They could see a low ridge at some distance from the shore beyond which the lodges stood back black against the stars and where the campfires were burning. All the warriors were standing about the blaze, gesticulating and talking and filling the air with noise and laughter. The boys lay in the low underbrush close to the water and could not see the stolen logs, but could still hear them knocking together as they floated in a crowded mass at the bend of the stream just below the stony bank. The village grew quiet as the evening advanced and the fires subsided into heaps of glowing coals. More than once a brave passed down to the river and came back, showing that the Indians were keeping close watch over their stolen property. When the lodges at last became silent, two men walked down together, talking as they came. They established themselves comfortably on a stretch of grass near to the high bank and above where the logs lay. Red men are not usually watchful at night since enemies of their own kind are seldom prone to come upon them in the dark. But where they, where they have to do, do with things concerning the whites, they realize that the same customs do not prevail. One Indian is seldom willing to watch alone, however. The darkness holds terror for superstitious, superstitious souls who picture the night as filled with dreaded spirits and with forces which they do not understand. If the logs were to be guarded, it must be by two men together. The boys, still lying in their place of concealment, could see the pair settling themselves for the long vigil. The Indians talked together for a little, then fell silent. Finally, one of them began to nod, but was peremptorily awakened by the other. What are they doing now? Stuart whispered close to Chris's ear. The two sentinels were neither talking nor sleeping, but were making odd motions with their hands just above the surface of the ground. They had built a tiny fire for the sake of its light, a mere glow of coals in the hot darkness. One of them lifted something whose shape was difficult to make out in the dim illumination. After long puzzling, however, Chris was able to breathe a reply into the ear of his companion. It was a moccasin, he held up. They're playing the moccasin game. They're gambling. Indians love games of chance, and in the hours when there is no pressure of work upon them, they will gamble intermin interminably with an absorption that even a white man can scarcely understand. A certain game is a favorite with a large number of tribes, so that Chris had seen it followed amongst the Chippewa and recognized it again as these two warriors fell to playing it. It is very simple. Three moccasins are laid out in a row. One Indian takes a bullet or a stone in his hand and passes it in and out of the moccasins. He leaves it in one and the other attempts to guess where it is. That's all. No white man would spend a long night over such a pastime, growing more and more interested and excited with every turn. Indians are like children in their enjoyment of simple pleasures. They are like the wisest of old men in the wit and craft which they can bring to the pursuit of them. The two who were playing were evenly matched, and luck seemed to reside first with one and then with the other. The game waxed hot, and all thought of tedium or of terror of the dark was plainly at an end. The two warriors might perhaps have heard a soft rustle now and then amongst the bushes, as though a raccoon or a weasel were stealing down to the river to drink, but such small, furry game interested them not at all, while that fascinating occupation still went forward between them. The little light of their fire made the darkness like a wall all about them. They might have heard once in a while a gentle splash or a subdued thump, 
as though one floating body had jostled another in the quiet course downstream. But all such gentle noises, merging into the whisper of the water, fell upon deaf ears. The bullet went in and out of the moccasin, and the fateful question of where it lay obscured all other matters. As for the two boys, of all the toiling hours which had demanded patience and self-restraint, these asked for the most. Chris, waist-deep in the gently moving stream and hidden by the shadow of the overhanging bank, laid hands upon one log after another. With the gentlest of motions, he pushed them in a single file across the shingle bar and within the reach of the stronger current. Some yards further downstream, Stuart was stationed, armed with the iron hook PV which had been left in the boat and which he had gone back to fetch for this new adventure in log running. Just here, the water poured over a ledge in a brief stretch of rapid current. As the dark trunks came sailing slowly toward him, he gave them another impetus over the drop in the stream bed, pushing with stronger force than Chris had dared to do, but taking infinite pains that no sudden movement or unwary splash should betray what was going forward. The water ran somewhat quicker near the mouth of the creek and carried the logs faithfully down toward the Mississippi. Half of them were dispatched. Two-thirds? They were nearly all gone. Chris, as absorbed as those two gamblers on the bank, pushed the last one into the main channel. One, two, three. There's only one left, the great walnut tree. It was a ground of that, he felt sure, but the last thing which he would ever have occurred to him was the thought of leaving it as a prize for the Indians. He waded toward it, moving as softly as he could. He looked over his shoulder and saw one of the Indians get up. Immediately, he froze to complete stillness and held his breath. No, he had not been seen. The Indian was simply going back to the camp, perhaps to get food. The one who was left had stopped to blow upon the fire, anxious for more light if he were to be left alone. If the flame were to blaze high, he would catch sight of the boy in the water. Chris was beside the log. He had pushed it free. It was floating. He let it slide past him, then slipped along on the far side of it, to give it further impetus. It grazed the bottom, floated and grounded again. Chris could see the flare of the fire leaping up beyond the great mass of the log. He heard a sound of feet on the shore, but dared not to look about or lift himself to glance over the top of the great trunk. Now they were in deep water again. The log was floating and he was swimming beside it with his hand on the spruce outriggers. A few more yards and they would drift around a bend of the stream. He raised himself in the water to strike out more boldly. At just that instant, a hand with a grasp of steel seized him by the knee and dragged him under the water.